How to Treat Inguinal Hernia Without Surgery, Part 2. Chapter 1. General Description of Hernia. A protrusion of any viscous from its proper cavity is denominated a hernia. The protruded parts are generally contained in a bag, formed by the membrane with which the cavity is naturally lined. Several parts of the body afford examples of this disease. A deficiency in the bones of the head will sometimes allow the protrusion of part of the brain and its membranes, from the inner to the outer side of the skull, forming a hernia of this organ. An imperfect state of the intercostal muscles may permit part of the lung with its pleura to form an external tumour or hernia of the contents of the chest. But the disease most frequently occurs about the cavity of the abdomen, and on this account, as well as from its superior importance in a surgical point of view, I shall confine my observations to this species, with its several varieties. Many reasons may be assigned for the very frequent occurrence of protrusions from the abdomen. First, the viscera of this cavity are numerous, some of them very movable, and others loosely connected by peritoneal attachments with the surrounding parts, and they are constantly exposed to changes of size and relative situation, from sudden or gradual distension. Secondly, the parieties of the abdomen are composed of muscles which, when in action, contract the dimensions of this cavity, compress the bowels, and thus have a tendency to force them from their natural situation. Thirdly, for the passage of vessels and nerves, these muscles and their tendons have various apertures, which, though naturally only large enough for that purpose, often become so much relaxed as to allow the viscera themselves to protrude. Lastly, the muscles are sometimes imperfectly formed and the viscera escape through unnatural apertures. The following are the situations in which abdominal hernia are found. First, it appears at the abdominal rings, generally passing in the same course with the spermatic cords in the male and the round ligaments of the uterus in the female. Thence, it is continued down into the scrotum in the one sex and the labium pudendi in the other. This hernia of the abdominal ring is known to surgeons under the various appellations of inguinal hernia, bubonocele, scrotal hernia, and osteocele. Secondly, a hernia also penetrates under pupa's ligament, forming a tumour at the inner and upper part of the thigh. In this situation, it is called femoral hernia, crural hernia, or merocele. Thirdly, Another species is formed at the navel by a protrusion through the opening which was formed in the fetus for the passage of the umbilical cord. This has received the name of umbilical hernia, or exomphalos. Fourthly, similar protrusions take place through the tenderness covering of the anterior part of the abdomen. The linear alba and semilunaris are perforated to transmit vessels passing to the common integuments. When these holes are either originally of an unusual size or are enlarged during a relaxed state of body, hernia will occasionally be formed in them, which are then called ventral. Fifthly, another part at which hernia sometimes appears is the foramen ovale of the pelvis. It then takes the name of the aperture and is termed hernia foramenis ovalis, obturatoria, or hernia thyroidea. Sixthly, Sometimes, though rarely, a hernia is produced at the ischiatic notch projecting by the side of the sciatic nerve under the glutei muscles. This takes the name of the part and is termed hernia of the ischiatic notch or ischiatiocele. Seventhly, sometimes a hernia passes between the bladder and rectum in the male and between the rectum and uterus in the female, appearing in the perineum. It is then called hernia perinae. Eighthly, I have seen the vagina protruded by a descent of the viscera between the rectum and uterus, and pushed backwards by the bladder, forming a considerable external tumour when the bladder was full, which disappeared as soon as it was emptied. Ninthly, I have met with a hernia protruding into the labium pudendi, passing under the ramus of the ischium with the internal pudendal artery, but continued into the pelvis by the side of the vagina. Tenthly, Hernia has been known to protrude through the diaphragm, sometimes by the side of the esophagus, sometimes accompanying the vena cava inferior, sometimes, though more rarely, by the side of the aorta, but more frequently through unnatural apertures in the muscle. Eleventhly, 
I have two preparations in my possession of hernia occasioned by the viscera passing between the laminae of the peritoneum. In one of these, they passed into the mesentery. Twelfthly, in the other, into a bag formed by a separation of the laminae of the mesocolon, in which all the small intestines were contained, and the mesentery is imperfectly formed. Openings are sometimes found in it, through which the viscera pass and become strangulated. These can scarcely be termed hernia, as the intestine still remains within its proper abdominal cavity. That species of hernia, which from its frequently appearing at the time of birth is called congenitor, takes the same course through the abdominal rings as the inguinal hernia. But instead of passing down upon the forepart of the spermatic process, it descends within the tunica vaginalis testis and ought therefore to be named the hernia tunicae vaginalis. There is no part of the abdomen, excepting where the parotes are formed of bone, at which hernia may not occur. For when the formation of the muscles is defective, it may happen even at the loins, in which case the kidney has been known to be part of the protruding substance. But of all the varieties of this disease which I have enumerated, the inguinal, femoral, and umbilical hernia most frequently occur. The difference in the structure and economy of some parts of the abdominal parietes in the two sexes renders the one sex disposed to that kind of hernia from which the other is comparatively exempt. Thus, the large size of the inguinal canal in men causes inguinal hernia to be a very common disease among them, whilst among females it is but rarely met with, and, on the contrary, the proportions of the female pelvis and distension of the abdomen from pregnancy together with other circumstances, dispose this sex to be the frequent subjects of crural and umbilical hernia, which may be regarded as uncommon diseases in man. The names that have been given to different kinds of hernia have been derived from their contents as well as their situations. If they contain only omentum, they are called omental hernia, or epiplacele. If only intestine, intestinal hernia, or enterocele. If both omentum and intestine, enteroepiplacele. If the stomach is contained in the tumor, gastrocele. If the liver, hepatocele. If the bladder, cystocele or hernia cystica. If the uterus, hysterocele. And the same of others, for excepting the duodenum and the pancreas, which are too closely connected with the spine easily to change their situation. All the different abdominal viscera have occasionally been found to form the contents of a hernial tumour. However, the viscera usually met within hernia are the omentum and the ilium. The next in frequency is the colon, then the cecum, and lastly, the jejunum. Sometimes the appendix cecae is the only part of the intestine found in the hernial sac. The cavity of the abdomen is everywhere lined by a peritoneum, which, in hernia, generally protrudes prior to the descent of any viscous, and thus a bag or sac is formed by this membrane, in which the protruded viscera are afterwards contained. To this there are occasional exceptions, arising from some of the viscera being only partially covered by a peritoneum in their natural state. The older surgeons thought that hernae were formed by a laceration of the peritoneum and abdominal muscles, which gave rise to the term rupture. But dissection has proved that such a rupture of the membrane scarcely ever happens. The peritoneum in forming a hernial sac is not dragged from its natural situation, but becomes elongated by gradual distension, and it is usually not only lengthened, but slightly thickened, for a long continued pressure of moderate force will produce an elongation and thickening of fibre, though a greater degree will bring about an entire absorption of parts. This is proved, in the first case, by the vast increase of size and thickness which the tunica vaginalis undergoes in an old hydrocele, and in the second, by the entire removal of the sternum and cartilages of the ribs in aneurysm. It is by the first of these principles in the animal economy that a hernial sac is produced, and if the sac be compared with the peritoneum from which it originated, it will generally be found to be a more dense and compact membrane. But when the hernia becomes of very considerable magnitude, the peritoneum forming the sac becomes thinner than natural, for the extension may go beyond the degree at which pressure thickens. And from this cause, it is that in old and large hernia, the peristaltic motion of the intestines may sometimes be seen through the sides of the sac. 
This is also one reason why hernia is sometimes found without sacs. For the process of extension having ceased, the sac becomes either entirely absorbed or remains only at the orifice. And hence, over the larger part of the tumor in one species of hernia, frequently no covering is left for the protruded viscera but skin and cellular membrane. On the other hand, the sac has occasionally been observed to be so much thickened as to retain nothing of its original peritoneal texture and to be divisible into layers. But from what I have seen of this disease, I am induced to believe that this opinion has originated from the want of sufficient distinction between the coverings of the sac and the sac itself. For as far as I can discover from dissection, it is the former which are extremely thickened in old hernia, whilst the latter is but little denser than the peritoneum. A hernia sac, however small, adheres to the parts by which it is surrounded but yet can be readily drawn into the cavity of the abdomen. This I have several times done in the dead subject, and have then seen the sac lying loosely within the cavity of the abdomen at the orifice through which it had descended. The return, however, of the sac can only be effected whilst the hernia is small and in the most recent state. For if it has been of long standing or has descended far, it has always contracted such firm adhesions to the surrounding parts that it can be separated only by dissection. At first, the adhesions are few and weak, but they gradually become strong and uniformly spread over the surface of the sac. The opening by which the sac communicates with the abdomen is generally its smallest part and is called its mouth. But when it has passed a short way from the abdomen and has quitted the tendons which surround its mouth, it enters parts more easily distensible than tendinous structure and then dilates into a bag of a piriform shape. As the hernial sac generally passes through openings which are designed for the passage of blood vessels, its exact situation, with respect to these vessels, should be attended to most carefully. Nor are those which accompany the hernial tumour the only vessels that require attentive observation. For in the two most important hernia, the inguinal and femoral, an artery passes near the orifice of the sac, the course of which it is of the utmost importance for the surgeon to observe, as an ignorance of it must often expose the life of the patient to imminent risk in the operation for hernia when in a state of strangulation, as two cases hereafter detailed will show. The coverings with which a hernial tumour is invested will entirely depend on the nature and structure of the parts protruded before the sac. Thus, in one kind of inguinal hernia, muscular fibre is found to be a covering. In another species, the dense tendon of a muscle is the envelope, while in a third variety, we find both these coverings combined. Several hernial sacs are sometimes found in the same subject at different parts. An instance of this is subjoint, that occasioned a difficulty in determining which was to be the subject of operation. Sometimes, more than one hernia exists in the same situation. I have a preparation of two hernial sacs at each groin with another in an incipient state on the left side. And the subject of one of the plates in this part of the work represents two hernia on one side and one on the other. When this is the case, they seldom are all at the same time in a state of protrusion, and the second sac is often formed after the cure of the first, two examples of which will be hereafter related. A hernial sac is sometimes burst by a blow. When this happens, its contents escape out of the sac and become placed under the contiguous skin, so that the viscera require to be returned into the sac before they can pass into the abdomen. I attended a case of inguinal hernia under these circumstances with Mr. Brookenden, a surgeon in Southwark. The viscera had escaped under the skin of the scrotum through a hole in the forepart of the sac and were obliged to be returned into the sac before the reduction of the hernia could be effected. The protruded parts are not always, however, contained in a sac, for when hernia arises from a malformation of the muscles, attended with unnatural apertures in them, these holes are not always covered by peritoneum. This was the case in a hernia protruding through the diaphragm, which I met with some years ago. The colon, the viscous that had escaped into the chest, was lying upon the lung without any peritoneal sac. This exception, however, does not universally hold in the diaphragmatic hernia, for I have known one instance in which the viscera were included in a process of peritoneum. The hernia congenita has not a peritoneal covering distinct from the tunica vaginalis testis, except in a very uncommon variety of the disease. 
The hernia cystica is described as being equally destitute of this membranous coat, but this is only true in the commencement of the disease. Dr. Marshall has a preparation of umbilical hernia in which no sac appears, but the protruded parts lie in direct contact with the skin. This variety is very rare, but the possibility of such an occurrence should be known, as in performing the operation for hernia, extreme care should on this account be taken to avoid wounding any of the protruded viscera.